Greetings! My name is the Smaltzy Cynic. Today we're starting off our playthrough of Shadowrun Dragonfall, the director's cut. So if you want the full kind of experience, I will have at least by the time I upload this video, the entire Returns uh, Let's Play finished. And what I kind of have planned, since it's going to take some time to finish this one along with the uh, next game, is that I might dabble in some of the mods and some of the kind of fun little side stories that kind of uh, have always been kind of something I always wanted to kind of experience and never got the chance to. So this would be kind of my excuse to do so. And that includes things such as, oh yeah, the Super Nintendo reboot. But we're not doing that one today. Nope. Today we're going to do the default campaign, which is regarded as probably the best out of the three games. And I agree to that to a certain extent. Well, I can't really say infer yet because of the uh, fact that I haven't finished Hong Kong. But uh, I can say there are some downsides to it that I will go into more detail as we play through the game. But regardless, let's go into the actual campaign itself. And I'll play on hard difficulty because I already got that from the past uh, playthrough. Now, among all the many improvements added to the... Uh, Director's Edition, they actually added a custom archetype. So uh, if you want the full, let's, or not full, uh, what I meant to say was if you want the full kind of RPG experience, you can kind of MacGyver your own runner of sorts. But uh, in our last game, we were a rigger. And in this game, we're going to be a decker. And from what I remember, there's actually no, um, what's it called? There's no actually like connective storytelling. Hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. That was getting a little too blaring for me and I couldn't even hear myself think. So uh, hopefully that will sound better when I listen to it in the video. But as I was saying, in our first playthrough, we were a complete rigger. And you don't really have any kind of connective story between these uh, three trilogies. So the best thing to do if you want my suggestion is to play these as completely three separate characters. But, um, for my purposes, my kind of mm, pseudo storytelling here is that I'm a rigger and my uh, data jack got damaged or something. I lost control of my drones. So I decided to go take up the uh, decking career instead since I couldn't rely on them anymore. Not the most creative storytelling, but you know, whatever. It's my excuse to load it up. So it'll be a decker and that's already auto generated. Perfect. Um, small little touch, but the, you will notice that a lot of the portraits in the future sequels are a lot better quality. And I don't just mean that in terms of like, they don't look like they just put a bunch of junk on top of their faces, but they actually look like they took the time to kind of make them more personal to the uh, world. Whereas the first game, I mean, they look kind of generic and all, but you know, I'm just rambling about stuff. I thought it was a little cool touch. So the karma system is basically the same. So we'll go into decking this time, which isn't too much of a deviation. Um, do I need it at the beginning of the combat? No. But what I could do is because I want to have at least two etiquettes at the time. One that's academic. And then when I choose the other one, I'll choose like Shadowrun or something like that. Or security, whichever, whichever prefers to me. Um... Right, I need to choose my uh, type of weapon. So obviously range. And I think I'll stick with the SMG. That's kind of my go-to weapon in these games. Perfect. Yeah, I can be a little gimped at the beginning. It's fine. Alright, so I got academic. And let's go into security since I got the uh, technical know-how. Kind of matches the most reasonable one for that. But anyways, let's just get started. Oh, come on. Stupid thing. I love technology, don't you? The Harfield Manor Run. Life was good. Easy jobs, regular pay, a reliable crew. But things went south and you had to drop off the grid. Put a bullet in the past and start fresh somewhere new. See? Kind of works with my general idea of starting over on a new complete class, but whatever. The promise of opportunity and anonymity 
draws you to the free city of Berlin, the flux state, a grand experiment in social order. Corporations tread carefully here. Even the dra great dragon, Lofur, only has so much sway in the constantly evolving power structure of Berlin. The perfect place for a savvy Shadowrunner to disappear and begin anew. And as luck would have it, home to your old partner in crime, Monika Schaefer. And it's your third run in the. It's your third run with Monica and her team, an old castle holdfast, one hour east of Berlin, perched atop a hill overlooking the countryside. The job is standard smash and grab, check the vault, grab the data, get out in one piece. A mediocre payday, but work is work. As the team gathers for Monica's pre reef running. Uh, they still make it easier to read. As the team gathers for Monica's pre run built. As the team gathers for Monica's pre run briefing, you pause to take in your surroundings. The estate grounds are silent, save for the faint whistling of the wind. Your team gathers near a side entrance to the old castle holdfast, cloaked in darkness. The night is peaceful. You know it won't last. You know it for what it is, a pleasant illusion that will shatter at the sound of the first gunshot. Listen up, folks. Monica Schaefer, you ran up, you ran with her back in the day. Now she's your team leader. Your decking sails may be sharp, but hers are Nova hot. Running with Monica is like taking a masterclass in icy breaking. We're on a tight term. We're on a tight timetable. I want to enter the estate, find the basement, open the data vault, extract the files, and bolt. Ten minutes, top to bottom. Trying to get in home in time for worm talk, love. Dietrich, shaman, the old man of the team. He smiles at her, his facial tattoos writhing in the moonlight. Monica's eyes twinkle with mischief. Maybe. How many times have I told you? You can't trust anything that comes out of a dragon's mouth. That trid trash will rot your brain. She grins. It's educational. Besides, this should be a milk run. Security is supposed to be light. A few automatic weapons, no A few automatic weapons, no armor. With a little luck, they'll never know we're here. In my experience, there is no such thing as a milk run. Words of wisdom from one of our new addition. I agree with Smaltzy. Glory, razor sharp street samurai. Her voice is cold and neutral. Her expression placid. They may be only private security, but their bullets don't know that. I can patch you up if I have to, but I'd rather not have to. You people just need to relax. We're professionals, remember? Monica raised her arm and speaks into her right wrist-mounted comlink. A dark face shimmers on the view screen. Iger, are you in position? The comlink crack crackles and the response comes back low and soft, softer than you expect from a troll. Affirmative. The alarm lines have been cut. I have a clear line of fire on the estate service entrance. When you exit the building, the path will be clear. Excellent. Thank you, Iger. Just doing my job. Iger out. The comlink goes dark. Monica winks at you as she drops her arm. See? We're all professionals. All right, people. Enough chatter. Our client wants the data from the vault, so we get it to him. So we get him the data from the vault. Quick, quiet, and clean. Oh, and quick. <laughs> you said quick twice. She grins. Warm talk is on tonight. Glory raises his eye. Glory raises an eyebrow slightly. I told you, it's educational. So the nice thing with this uh, tutorial is that it actually gets you pretty set up at the beginning. So here I can just grab a weapon, my choice. For my sake, I'm getting the SMG. And I'm going to get my Decker kit. So, I got a... Uh, let's see, what do I got? Alright, so the first level gun. Unfortunately, the, the item system still is crappy. So, that doesn't really improve or get better in this game. But then again, I'm not really playing this game for the loot. It's more so for the storytelling and the combat. Which, you know, it's it's about as good as it, got, as it was in the previous game. Just more of it and better executed. Anyways, let's break in and start entering.
Now one thing that isn't immediately apparent yet is that the UI has done a massive overhaul. Although it still has some of its uh, former kind of uh, iPhone aesthetic. But when it gets to combat, it's a major difference. Hmm. Well, I got this robot arm. I'll probably be fine. <laughs> What's wrong, Dietrich? Not a smart move, Kleiner. We have a job to do, and hauling a great bag, great big vase ain't around isn't part of it. Dietrich offers you a toothy grin. Unless the vase figured into your plans to complete the mission somehow, did you have a vase oriented strategy that I was unaware of? <laughs> I was thinking we could use it to smuggle Monica into the data vault. He stifles a chuckle. An excellent plan. I fully support it. We should get moving, though. We mustn't keep the others waiting. I did not even expect that would happen, but, uh, <laughs> nice save. Okay. So we're about to enter combat once we open this door. Okay, da 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 da. Know how it works. And as you can see, much cleaner, much more elegant, and hell, a lot even more obvious on how to use it. So, big improvement overall compared to the first game. And you notice when uh, we hover over the uh, the camera, let's say if I get over here, you can actually see that it's actually flanked. So there's actually kind of more uh, mechanics added to the game. All right, that was easy. See, we're all professionals. Security alert response plan, Quebec 6. Matrix operations locked. HDR team responding. Okay. All done. See? May not be a hotshot like her, but uh, I'm competent enough. One guy up there. Oh, two of them. Ooh, that was a nasty hit. Okay, pretty shitty odds, but then again, not exactly uh, decked out for that, am I? Okay, here's what we'll do. He's a bigger threat right now. I have really bad odds at this part of the game, but uh, I'm not surprised. I'm really bad with that SMG. Really? Finally. Okay. Figured once we killed them, we wouldn't have to heal ourselves, so just saved us ourselves a, an extra turn. All right. Another. Uh. Let her do it. She's probably more competent, has more programs and stuff. And as you can tell, we're already into the phase where we're combining uh, decking and real-time combat. Which, if you remember, that took until like the very uh, final act to get to in the first game. So, let that be a sign of how uh, things are different in this time around. First time I tried this and tested it out, it wasn't that hard. Okay then, duly noted, you need to play seriously.
Bingo. Alright, so we got some payday stuff. Extra little bonus thing. Now, the only reason we haven't gone back to the real world is that there are certain sections where it will just be like this. So, if there's not any combat, you don't have to worry about that extra stuff. Alright, here's the actual first tough sequence. Especially with my shitty stats. But at least I can mark them, so that's at least helpful. Oh, she's still over there. Wow. You got a lot of catching up to do, girl. You know, considering that these are going to be four characters we're going to see constantly, I could, though I didn't plan it, you know, I could change their profile pictures if I wanted to, but you know, I'll keep it as it is for right now. I mean, it would look nice. Okay, let's get these guys marked. I'll at least make it easier for my other teammates so they can do the actual job. So here you can actually see a lot more cover is uh, used when it, when, uh, <laughs> let me try the sentence again. So here you can see that cover is a bigger problem when handling uh, these kind of targets. So keep that in mind because cover works completely differently in the from the first game, which is a good thing because now it actually feels like cover. And if you're standing out like I am, that's a pretty bad idea. Okay, let's get him patched up. Let's see. All right, probably a good idea. All right, one down. Yeah, go ahead and flank him. Glory has a lot of uh, useful stuff with her claws later on, which is why I kind of want to get in the habit of doing this because boy can she tear them up. Especially that bleeding effect. Okay, so here. All right, how about you mark the target? Thank you. And then you go full auto. <laughs> yes. Oh, you hit my friendly targets? Okay, I'll keep that in mind. Nope, 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 nope. I hate when that does that. Didn't say the UI was perfect, now did I? Okay, all dead. Curious what that uh, poison thing, I guess it could have been like a summon a spirit. That's possible. But I think we'll be fine right now. Yeah, we can transition to a new location. So far, so good. It's your skirmish w with security, uh, sorry. 
So far, so good. If your skirmish with security set off any alarms, you don't hear them. Monica leads with the rest of the team downstairs, into the basement of the Hartfield Manor. Your payday is waiting. The data vault lies ahead. Deidre's eyes the door, then turns to Monica. This is a big freaking vault, Libshin. Bigger than on the schematics. The schematic didn't have a date. Our client may have old intel. Still, our instructions were clear. The data we're looking for should just be on the other side of the door. Monica combs a hand through her hair, parting it to reveal the black plastic sheath of her data check. A quick jaunt into the matrix, a little digital hand waving, and I'll have this thing wide open. I'll be right back. A burst of static crackles through the tiny speaker on Monica's comlink. Iger still in position outside the estate. Hold on, who's in charge while you're jacked in? Monica rolls her eyes, Dietrich fixer fixes his stare intently on the vault door. Glory still looks cold and distant, just as she always does. We've been through this before, Iger. You're not in KSK anymore, and that chain of command nonsense doesn't fly in the shadows. We don't need rules and regulations to guide us. The same principles that apply to the flex state. Please spare me the lecture. Your politics have nothing to do with this. Best get used to it, Iger love. Look, it's a simple answer. Look, it's a simple question. Years of experience tell me that it needs an answer. Iger's right, Monica. We should have a second in command just in case. Monica stares at you for a moment, clearly irritated. Then that twinkle appears in her eyes again. She smiles at you as she speaks into her comlink. Very well, we'll do this Iger's way. While I'm jacked in, Smaltzy is in charge. There is a pause, then Iger voice crackles out of the comlink again. Did I hear you right? You're putting the rookie in command? Look, you asked for a decision and you got one. This is ridiculous. I know that this is a joke to you, Monica, but I'm telling you. Iger. Monica's tone is all business. Evidently, she has heard enough. The decision's made. You have your answer. Acknowledge. That another word, Iger's image flickers and fades from Monica's communicator. I apologize if there's rain in the background. I, it just suddenly appeared, so, uh... We should be fine if I... Because it's going to be a combat sequence, but, you know. Just letting you know in case you hear it. Sorry about that. Iger can be inflexible. Legacy of a long military career. But she knows what she's doing. And she means well. I mean, it's a legitimate concern. She hardly knows me. Her eyes narrow. There's a thin line between concern and insubordination. You let me know if she crosses it. Okay, enough chatter. Let's get let this get this. Okay, enough chatter. Let's get this done. She turns to the door, fingers poised on the controls of her cyber deck, then glances back at you with a wide grin. See you on the other side. Then she punches it, projecting her consciousness into cyberspace. Her fingers harmonizing in the smooth, rhythmic staccato that only an expert decker can achieve. Well, things are going pretty well so far, don't you agree? Oh, shit. Without warning, Monica's back arches violently and her head jerks back, silencing her terrible screams. Muscle spasms ripple throughout her face, and her jaw snaps shut, sending a, sending a mist of blood spraying from between her teeth. You look down to see a nub of pink flesh hit the floor, the tip of her tongue. The room explodes into action. Glory leaps towards Monica, her hand outstretched to yank the cord from her data jack. Deatrich surges forward to wrap the teen's fallen Decker in a bear hug, holding her against the convulsions that rack her body. With Monica's unearthly scream still ringing sharply in your head, you are only dimly aware of the door slamming shut behind you. Hmm. Well, smashing the cyber deck wouldn't really help. Let's try to hold her down. As Deatrich holds Monica's thrashing body, you grab her head in both hands and hold it steady. Glory wraps a cybernetically enhanced hand around the cord, leading to Monica's data jack and pries it free. The comlink sense of charred meat and ozone filled the air. You've seen the effects of biofeedback before, but nothing but like this. Suddenly, Monica's eyes flutter open. Muscle tremors continue to distort her face, and blood oozes between her lips. You see the concentrate. 
You see the muscles in her jaws tensing and a look of concentration in her eyes. She's struggling to speak. Okay, talk to me. What are you trying to say? Slowly, painfully, Monica rests her jaw open. The blood well up in her mouth comes pouring out in a slick covering her chest. She expels a thick, guttural sound that might be a word. Satisfied, she closes her eyes and forces her mouth to make the shapes she needs. Fear. F -f 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 fear With an effort, Monica opens her eyes again and meets yours. You see pain and fear in her gaze. And something else. Hope? Furish wing she... <laughs> I'm par apologies for ruining the moment, but I just can't say this. Sorry. Sudden spasm jerks Monica's head back again. She grunts, then her chin drops to her chest and her head lulls to one side. Her eyes fix on an object in the next room, a computer terminal. The soft life of a cursor blinks on its receipt recess screen. Slowly, she attempts to speak again, but the only sound that emerges is a long, strangled croak. A look of resignation washes over Monica's face, and she stops fighting. Her gore-slick jaw goes slack, and she dies. Well. This shirt went into hell in a handbasket in the first, you know, first 10, 30 minutes. Okay, I thought I had karma points. All right. So, we're down a man. And I'm completely shit at, at stats. So, uh, not good odds so far. Okay. See if you can maybe uh, help us out a little bit, Dietrich. Okay. I'll take that. This is a win. Okay, let's try this again. Can't hit shit. Well, that's what I get for not uh, choosing the right perks, huh? Oh, wow. That hit pretty hard. Okay. We're gonna need uh, some help, so uh, how about... Give me some aim boost, please. Wow. Those are still pretty awful odds. Alright. Finish him with your claws. Are you kidding? Thank you. Okay, so blah 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 blah. Just repeating my name. They seal the door behind us. We gotta find another way out of here. What are you doing? I think Monica may have inserted a bug into the system before she died. What for? Something tells me we're gonna have more company soon. I don't know yet. Watch my back while I figure this out. Problem has been detected with a core component. Restore default settings. It will take several minutes to execute. Connected doors and peripherals will be disarmed when complete. Okay. 0% complete. As you watch, the number on the screen slowly begins to climb. This is going to take a while. You glance down at a second screen to see that the facility is on high alert. In place of a simple data vault, it seems you have been stumbled across some massive underground complex. A map of the Holdfest grounds indicates that security forces are en route from several angles. The doors currently rebooted by the system's restore process are flashing a dull red. If you're reading this display correctly, the only exit from this room is to hold fast in the old servant's entrance, on the western side of the building. At that moment, Iger's wi image winks into your comlink with a crackling sound. The image is grainy, flickering in and out. What's going on there, down? What's going on down there, rookie? Talk to me. Iger, new extraction point. Hold up, where's Monica? I'm sorry, Iger, Monica didn't make it. Now, we have to get out of here. Look for old servant's entrance. To the west, on the main grounds, we'll rendezvous with you there. Her silence is thick, but when she finally responds, her tone is professional. Roger that. She cuts out with another word. Glory turns to you, her movements smooth and robotic. 
Her voice comes out in frosty monotone. What's the place, Maltzy? Hmm. Our escape route will open in a minute. We'll hold tight until then. By hold tight, you mean sit here and fry anyone who comes to that door, don't you? Pretty much, yeah. I could do that. When the door locks the... I thought so. When the door locks disarm, we make a break for it. Until then, we make them pay for Monica. Dietrich and Glory nod in agreement. See, I'm a natural board leader. Now it's gonna be this entrance over here. So we should probably at least get to this point. All right, I'm a bit wounded, so go ahead and... No, <laughs> don't do that. All right. Okay, I'm gonna need the pain buff no matter what. Okay, let's quickly reload. All right, get over here, Glory. And just go ahead and reload your gun. Okay, thankfully we have some uh, tools at our disposal to kind of help, such as the shaman summons, but we should be fine if we play it smartly which is definitely not in my rule book. And of course I can't overshot, so that's not gonna help. What's this? One AP for three rounds. Okay, I'll keep that in mind in the future. All right. See if I can mark one at least. Good. Right, they can break armor in this game. I forgot about that. Oh, he can't see me. That's gonna be a problem. All right, here's what we do. All right, I got one at least. Do I sell the, uh... Yeah, I do. Okay, just want to make sure. Don't think... Okay, well, what I could do to help out... Summon one of these. The figure lopping towards you is big, even for an orc. The majority of his body is sheathed in a suit of heavy, overlapping plates. What you see is a face that looks raw and slick, like old scar tissue stretched tight over his skull. He wears an expression of supreme confidence. Alright friends, playtime's over. All you Shadowrunners are this game. Skulkering, sneaking, steal a vase or two from the museum. No harm. Maybe I'll let you scamper away into the night. But now it's too late for that sort of generosity. Visitors aren't welcome down here. The gaping maw The gaping maw of the minigun jerks upward, an impatient gesture, loaded with malice. Drop your weapons and surrender. That's military grade armor he's wearing. Hardened against small fire. That's military grade armor he's wearing, Smaltzy. Hard against small arms fire. We'll have a tough enough time cutting through it. I'm less concerned about the armor than I am about that minigun. Those things can tear a man in half. You have three seconds before I open the hose. Step out here and surrender, and I promise I'll make it easy. Something tells me you're gonna kill us either way. 
True, I can't deny it, but wouldn't it be easier if you just didn't fight back? The orc shrugs, and you hear the distinctive whir of his Vindicator motor spinning up to speed. The barrels begin to blur as he wheels the weapon to face you. So, in this instance, what we're going to do is we're going to have our uh, spirit here kind of take the blunt of the damage, so to speak. Because uh, there's no way we're going to handle something like uh, miniguns. Of course you miss. Wow, you're really missing everything here. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, that's at least done. Crap. Definitely not what I wanted. Okay. We just need to hold out four more turns, then we're in the clear. Okay. Shock should kill him at least. Oh, does he go AWOL? Please tell me this thing did go AWOL. Oh, great. Oh, this is just perfect. Oh, okay. Maybe it is fine. <laughs> if he's being distracted, that's fine by me. Eliminated. Okay, let's get that adrenaline pump. Of course. That would be nice. I really don't want to put myself out there, but we're going to have to go there anyway, so at least take him out. just need to hold out. And I need to heal myself up. Let's see. She should have the healing supplies, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Get around here, and now the escape should be clear. All right, that's what I wanted him to do. Focus on her. Focus on the spirit. <laughs> All right. Open the door. All right, Dietrich, you go first since you're the uh, spongiest here. Okay, she's got three, so I'll put her over here. Should be able to make it, no problems. See, they're distracted with uh, everything else. <laughs> oh wow, nice hit. I wonder if you can actually kill that boss. That'd be interesting. Oh, 
All right, that's fine. Maybe he can actually uh, take him out. Okay. Let's just hightail it out of here. Yeah, should be able to hit it in the next turn. Alright. We're almost here. Come on, you can make it, Dietrich. <laughs> You're the only one we're missing right now. Alright, good. Alright. You go next. I'll be last man out. Just like a natural born leader. Iger rises from her corpse strewn perch at your Iger rises from her corpse strewn perch at your approach. From the look on her face, it's obvious that she's already sized up the info. She's already sized up the situation. I knew this was going to happen. I fucking knew it. We could talk We can talk about this later. For now we need to get bug out. Tell me something I don't know. Iger slaps the side of the van. Pile in, people, and Smaltzy, when we get back to the cruiser bar, we're going to have a little talk. Cruiser Cruiserberg, home to nearly a half a million people and, until very recently, Monica Schaefer. Once the melting pot of cultural diversity, it's now a chaotic mess of wealth and poverty, crime and commerce, anarchy and control. It's also home to your very little slice of Berlin, a neighborhood that call, the locals call the Cruzabar, a safe port in the eye of a storm. The ride back to the Cruzabar is quiet. No one is in a talking mood. As the van veers past potholes and garbage piles, the glare of street lights and neon size plays across your window, painting the world in a kaleidoscope kaleidoscope of garish col garish colors soon the van rounds a corner and skids to a halt in a narrow crumbling alley this is as far as this is as far as berlin chaotic streets will take you your team wordlessly debarks debarks okay <laughs> why use fancy words when they're not going to really serve the purpose whatever your team wordlessly leaves a vehicle and climbs down into a disused section of the u ball tunnel system a well-kept secret providing your team safe passage into the cruise above Cruise Bazaar. Your safe hop waits on the other side. So yeah. Rough first mission, huh? To be honest, the first time I took a test to kind of see if the uh, hard mode would be that hard, I didn't have that much trouble. Maybe I played it on normal, I just don't remember it. Oh well. We'll just keep playing. We're doing fine so far. You step inside, and the squalor of the disused U-Ball tunnel gives way to the warmth of your safe house. A man waits inside, silhouette against the dim fluorescent lighting. Something bad has happened, hasn't it? He steps forward, revealing revealing a pale and expressionless face, light glistening off the stem, steel rim glasses. Paul Amsel, your team's fixer and landlord, part dealmaker, part information broker, one of the most well-connected men in Berlin. His eyes sweep across the team as he takes it all in. The grim faces, the hard stare, Iger's fury, Monica's absence. I had a feeling. How did she... His face has gone ashen. He swallows. Takes a moment to chew on the words before spitting them out. Something in the vault security system cooked her brain. It was too quick to be black IC. Glory nods, her motion robotic in spare. Monica died of biofeedback. Monica died of biofeedback induced stroke. That's right. Iger thrusts a glove finger into your chest. And this idiot stood by and let it happen. How should I approach this? Hmm. 
Let it happen. She jacked in. She screamed and she seized. By the time we saw that she was in trouble, it was already too late. Yeah, because you never bother learning what to look for. Muscle contractions and micro tremors are good indicators of a Decker in distress. I'm assuming you didn't have anyone keeping an eye out for those? No. If you had, my friend wouldn't be lying dead in a basement. Oh, shove off, Iger. We were all on the lookout for physical security, Smaltzy included. Throwing him under the bus isn't going to help anything. Under a bus is exactly where he belongs. Iger turns to face Dietrich. She towers over him, but he stands guard. He stands his guard. I respect you, Dietrich. You know that. But you don't have my training. None of you have. Monaco's good. She was the best, right? But she was also overconfident. She treated the job like it was a game. Do that long enough and you're gonna get burned. Iger turns her focus back to you. If you had been paying attention, you would have figured out all this out on your own by now. You would have known that Monica needed watching as much as that door. Enough. Amzel's voice is hoarse, his expression blank. Enough. Iger pushes ahead, heedless of the interruption. Her voice remains measured, but there's a fire in her eyes. How many seconds pl- How many seconds pass between Monica's first convulsion and her plug getting pulled? Four? Five? Do you know how much damage biofeedback- Do you know how much damage biofeedback can do to a Brecker's brain in five seconds? Look, this won't- You don't have to answer that. Of course you know. Monica died while you stood there and watched. This is all your f That's enough. Amsel's voice comes out in a roar, and his fist smashes down the desk behind him. <laughs> I really should have done it myself. That's enough! <laughs> I'm having too much fun here. Iger, you and Smaltzy can have it out later, but I have had enough. We need to talk action. Our client sent you into something much bigger than he led us to believe. I want to know why. I'm right there with you. This was supposed to be a milk run. Payback isn't the only reason why we need to find him. We saw something back there. Something that we weren't supposed to see. It's fair to assume that we're all still in danger. He pauses and rubs his temple. Agreed. And to neutralize that danger, we need to know who we are dealing with. Let us review the events that transpired tonight. The smallest detail could be important, so hold nothing back. Hmm. The estate was just a front for whatever was The estate was just a front for whatever was going on in the basement. That much is clear. It wasn't a minor enterprise either. The facility took serious funds to build. And time. There was more to it than we saw. Places like that just don't spring up overnight. And all in secret, the owners, whoever they may be, were none too pleased by your escape, I'm sure. What else did you find? Well, there was a guy in a there was an orc in a military grade armor. He appeared to be the head of security. That is not much to go on. Do any details about this orc come to mind? Any distinguishing features that I could look into? He was an older guy for sure. From the sound of his voice, I'm guessing mid to late 40s. Pretty old for an orc. And he had skin grafts. Most of his face looked like replacement material. If the grass came from a legitimate hospital, there may be medical records. That is something. I will look and see if I can find anything out. Did you know anything else? Monica lived long enough to say a name. Fwerschwinge. She fought hard to tell us. It must be important. Amsel seems taken aback. He pauses for a moment before responding. The Firewing. That is... unexpected. You'll have to forgive me. This brings back many unpleasant memories. The Firewing? The most terrible of the great dragons. There are those who would disagree, but they never experience the terror of living in her shadow. He glances at Glory. You are too far You are far too young to remember her, of course, but for Germans of my generation, the name Forschwin is synonymous with chaos, destruction, and death. The dragons of today are subtle creatures, full of patience and guile. Forschwin was not. After her awakening, she went on a four month rampage that claimed tens of thousands of lives. Amsel look takes a deep breath, slowly releases it, there's a haunted look in his eyes. Those were dark days. Countless men, women, and children were slaughtered, roasted alive in their homes by a creature of legend. No hope for salvation and no end in sight. It was a horror that you cannot begin to understand. What stopped her? I can't imagine that a rampaging dragon would just go out of its way of would just go away on its own. 
Eventually, the fire wing was brought down by a man named Dr. Adrian Vauclair. Well, with the help of the Luftwaffe, of course, but it was experimental weapons designed by the Dr. Vauclair that finally pierced her hide. She fell in a hail of bullets and rocket fire and crashed down in the radioactive wasteland of the Sox. This event was called the Dragonfall. Name drop! <sighs> Safe at last from the Dragon's Wrath, Germany celebrated Valclair as a hero, or our Siegfried, a modern day dragon slayer. My own family practically worshipped the man. If the Dragonfall was as if the Dragonfall was as important an event as you make it out to be, I'm surprised that I've never heard of it. Those early years of the awakening were traumatic, Iger, not just on a national level, but on a global scale. New species of awakened animals were being discovered daily. Within two years, the active use of magic had returned to the world, a new source of terror for a bewildered public. And in 2021, the sudden emergence of orcs and trolls gave way to yet another rise of global panic. 2021, eh? <laughs> oh boy. In light of such turmoil, is it any surprise that Dr. Von Clare and the Firewing were forgotten? Dragons were yesterday's news. He rubs his temples. Again, all this happened decades ago. Again, all this happened decades ago. To the best of my knowledge, the story of Forschwinge is still a bit of historical trivia, and nothing more. Alright, so Monica spent her dying breath trying to tell us about a long dead dragon. Iger sweeps her eyes across the group, searching for a glimmer of insight. Finally, she gives up. Any ideas why? Amsel's voice trembles with frustration. No. It doesn't make any more sense than it does to you. The Dragonfall is ancient history. First Winch has been dead and gone for 42, ye for 42 years. But there's one thing I'd like to know. Whatever Monica saw, whatever she was trying to tell us, it was important. He visibly struggles to calm himself, takes a deep breath, and then slowly releases it. I will look into this, and I will find answers. In the meantime, did you, it, did you turn up anything else of value? Nope, that's all we got. It's not much. Ansel nods, his face is drawn and haggard. It is thin, I agree, a basement, a middle-aged dwarf with skin grafts, and a long-forgotten world event. You haven't said anything about our client, Paul. Are you holding out on us? Wait, no. Whoever set this... Whoever sent us knew what we were walking into. We were set up. That's obvious, but why? Paul's face reddens. I warned her. I told her not to take this run, but she assured me it would be a cakewalk. You didn't bring it to her? No, she set the whole thing herself. Monica was approached by a man who calls himself Green Winters. He used to be a prominent activist in the F-State political scene. I never, much, I never much liked the man, and I certainly never trusted him. But Monica, she would do anything for her cause, anything for the Flux State. He sighs. <sighs> Winter swore that the data he was after was crucial to ensuring the future stability of the Flux. And that was all it took. It sounds like Green Winters is our best lead then. Yes, most definitely. It's clear that Green Winters has involved us in something much larger than he had led Monica to believe. When we find out what happened on the run, he's going to be... When he finds out what happened on the run, he's probably going to rab it. We need to chase him down before that happens. How do we find this guy? There's a man here in the Cruzabazar, a Turk named Atlug Baraskazai. Atlug Baraska... Barakazi. Okay, that'll work. Atlug Baraskazi. He owns a small soy calf cafe down the way called Cafe Seviz. The man is also a purveyor of information. I have done business with him from time to time. And you think he will know something about Green Winters? Amsel nods. When I discovered Monica's renewed association with Green Winters, I contacted Atlug. One of his people has been keeping tabs on Winters ever since. As I said, I do not trust this man. Well, it's for good reason it would seem. I'll talk to Atlug and see what he knows about Green Winters. Very well. Tell him I sent you. I will do what I can to dig up into the information that you've all uncovered already. Sparse though it may be. Oh. Boy, that was a lengthy introduction now, don't you think? Okay. 
So for the time being, I'm going to save my progress. And we'll come back and continue this episode for a little bit longer. You know, decent ways into the uh, story before we call it a day. So we'll be back shortly. Alrighty, we're back. That uh, last episode for Returns took a lot longer than I thought, but it was a lot of waiting more so than failing at the game. But anyway... Right, we were just uh, getting to know the team a little bit better. And now we're going to talk with, I guess, each of them individually. Okay, so let's meet Dietrich first. He seems to be on good terms with us. Dietrich turns his head at your approach. His aging face is traced with a network of faint scars. The legacy of too many fights over too many years. While he still retains a degree of strength and vigor, it's obvious that the shaman you see today is a shadow of his former self. Despite all of this, there is an aura of power surrounding the man. He raises his bottle, offering it to you. Smaltzy, welcome. I've got a bottle of snaps that needs sharing. And we've got a fallen comrade to drink to. Hmm. To Monica. Wait. Yeah, to Monica. The liquor in the bottle is crystal clear, and as you raise it to your... As you raise it, you catch an intoxicating wick of cloves and caramel. It tastes of sweet corn and walnuts, with a lingering aftertaste of buttery toffee. You swallow a swig, then return the bottle to Deatrice's outstretched hand. He takes a long, pu long pull of the bottle, then locks eyes with you. Let me ask you a question. What made you choose to come to Berlin? Hmm. I had my reasons. Such as, come on boss, I'm just trying to figure out who I'm working for here. I think I deserve that much, don't you think? So, this is all flavor text, but this is a nice change up from the first game where you didn't really have any character building moments, so this already is a vast improvement on the old one, because I can go with that. It, it, there really is no bad option here, it's just more so, hey, make up your own backstory as you play the game. like you know, role-playing. <laughs> so, uh, if this is my character from the Return series, which one makes the most sense? Uh, it was time for change, that's all. Oh, come on, boss. Nobody moves to Berlin without a good reason. If you must know, I came back from Monica. Well then, I'm sorry for your loss. Even sorrier, I mean, if a man can be such a thing. A look of profound sadness across his Dietrich's face and he takes another long swig of the bottle. Ah, yes, Monica. Dietrich raises his bottle again, then closes his eyes and takes a long drink. After the moment has passed, he returns his attention to you. It all comes back to our girl, doesn't it? So let me ask you, just what's your relationship with her anyway? I know you two knew each other way back, but she seems pretty... she was pretty coy about these things. Are you always this inquisitive? Yeah, I suppose. My life's an open book, so I guess I just sort of figured that everyone else's will be, too. So how about it? Want to fill me in? We were friends. Right there with you, and privileged to say so. She was one of the best women I've ever known. Anyway, I've taken enough of your time, and the bottle's almost empty. Thanks for taking the time to talk. For what it's worth, I'm happy you're here with us. He takes a final pull of the bottle and then tips it forward, pouring the rest onto the ground. Rest in peace, Monica. We'll miss you, girl. Well, he seems like we're going to get along just fine. Uh, let's have, speak of Glory. Seems to, be, seems to be doing all right. Glory is beautiful, in a waifish sort of way. Her features are almost elvish in their delicacy, but there's something cold about her that you find slightly unsettling. What's more unsettling is her chrome. She's rocking a heavy loadout of cyberware from head to toe. She looks to be composed more of plastic and metal, than she is of skin and bone. In the shadows, individuals such as this are anything but uncommon. But her cyberware is first generation, all of it. Bulky, invasive, practically museum pieces. This chrome was obsolete well before she was born. Smaltzy. Glory shifts her gaze to you, but her expression is as cool and placid as always. Can I help you? How are you holding up? Don't worry about me, I'm solid. If you say you're good, you're good. I will trust you. Her expression remains neutral, but she grants you a barely perceptible nod. So, do you have any thoughts on what we should do next? Find our missing client, extract some answers. Beyond that, take jobs and get paid. Okay. 
Now, I have a couple of questions of the personal sort. I'm not big on sharing sport. Personal reasons. You understand, I'm sure. The edge in her voice tells you that she's not interested in continuing this conversation. Okay. Well, tells me enough that I shouldn't press any further. Of course. We'll have our... Of course. But if you ever want to talk to me, I'll be here. Alright. Not too upset with me, but still not warming up to me yet. So here I can actually equip my, uh, uh, what is it? My supplies if I need to, since this is going to be our hideout, kind of like the Seamstress's Union in the first game. Alright. We all know we're waiting for this one. Alright, Iger, let's have it out. She stares at you, and you can taste the bile in her stare. She still clearly blames you for her Monica's death. Is there something that could do you, fearless leader? Hmm. You're wrong about me, Iger, and I intend to prove that to you. She stares at you for a moment, then looks away. Best of luck with that. Now please, leave me alone. Fine, as you wish. We'll try again when we're on better terms with her. Oh, Dante. As you step towards the safe house door, a large four-legged form steps around the corner. Dante, Monica's dog, an enormous mongrel of intermittent breed. A low whimper emerges as he enters the room, head hanging low. Oh shit, Dante. Don't worry, boy. We'll look after you. At the sight of Monica's dog, Amsel's eyes well up. He inhales but can't quite catch his breath. He started whimpering about an hour ago. Turned into a full-blown howl. Wouldn't stop. Kept... That's when I realized something bad had happened. Looking down to those huge brown eyes, you can see intelligence and sadness. He lets out a small whine and rubs his head against you. Uh, let's give him one of those treats off the table. He takes the treat in his mouth, but it's clear he has no appetite, and the jerky drops to the floor. He leans into you and looks up mournfully, pressing his ribs against your leg. I guess the dog is going with you. Amstel takes a ragged breath and releases it, then a slow, melancholy smile plays across his face. Well, perhaps a pot of Monica lives on in Dante. Return to the safe house when you finish with Atlug, mind friend. With a little luck, we can he can help us locate Green Winters, and we can get to the bottom of all this. And now I think we should all take a moment. For Monica. Hmm, I wonder if we can ask him further. Smaltzy. No, no, not yet. Okay, thought there was something we could do it a little bit further. I kind of want to get to the point where we get to our first actual operation, because that would be a good place to stop. So here we actually go into the little town, uh, kind of have a little bit of scenery and uh, wandering about to do. So this would be fun. The dwarvish tech vendor smiles at you with practiced ease, her almond eyes twinkling with the glare from a dozen trade screens. She speaks in clipped, heavily accented German. Welcome to the Data Haven. Can I help you with something? Hmm. I need some tech. Okay, so she can deck us out some, uh... What is it? Stuff. Okay. Um, right now I only have erosion. Okay, that's pretty bad. Hmm. That would be useful at this time. But, I think at the moment I need some... You know, uh, more stuff like this. Let's get a assassin program. Uh, that's actually too much. All right. Okay, let's get these two. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so I'll give you one plus intelligence. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> okay. Alright, let's solve this stuff. Let's see. Da -da -da -da. Alright, anything interesting? No, okay, it's just the same stuff. I thought there was like special items or something. 
All right, any other adventurous things to talk to or visit? A pair of round eyes peer up from you from under the hood of the grime-smeared winter coat. You recognize him as David, one of Cruz of Bazaar street kids. If you had to guess, you place him in the mid-teens, though it's difficult to tell but beneath the grime and acne marring his face. You've seen him following Monica around between runs, chasing her heels like a lost puppy. She always seemed to have a soft spot for the kid. Oh, hoy Smeltzy. Have you seen Monica around? I've been looking all over for her. Uh, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, kid. He blinks a blank expression on his face. She's dead, isn't she? I'm sorry, kid. We all are. Yeah, look, I think I just want to be alone right now. Well, can't argue with that. Hey, doesn't that guy look familiar? Hmm, maybe it's just crazy. Maybe it's just me being crazy. Something about the young elf behind the counter makes your catch breath catch in your chest. She's lovely to look at, but it's a strange kind of beauty. Her eyes are large and luminous and impossibly green. As she looks up at you, you can see that her irises are flecked with iridescent gold. Hello, and welcome to Algernon's. <gasps> that must mean... Perhaps I can help you with something. As she smiles up to you, her eyes are fixed on yours. A curious feeling of weightlessness fills your chest. It feels as though you're floating in a warm, calm sea. A gentle current pulls you closer to Abenstein, and the sensation is pleasant. As you drift, the golden specks in her eyes begin to move. So here you can already see how there's a lot more actual like dialogue options and uh, things for your stats to do. So if you're a mage, this would be kind of something you can kind of test yourself against. The golden spelt specks in the elf's eyes shift and swirl, slowly picking up speed. It's memorizing. All at once, the specks explode into light and color. Her eyes are now filled with your field of vision, and it feels as though you're drowning in an alien sea. The patterns traced by the shimmering specks in her eyes are kaleidoscopic, enchanting, nearly impossible to turn away from. And I have zero willpower, so I'm going to lose myself. You are lost. Your entire world has been reduced to a churning vortex of green and gold. Dimly, you become aware that something is up happening. You feel your body being buffeted by unseen forces. And suddenly, everything goes black. Well, this sure isn't a good day to start. Slowly and painfully, you struggle your way back to the consciousness. The shop's owner is peering down at you, an expression of concern on his face. Abbotstein stands beside him. Her expression is of one of embarrassment. Welcome back, friend. Algernon extends a hand to help you to your feet. Abbotstein shifts slightly to allow you to stand. <laughs> well, that was an introduction to have a familiar face. So, just what just happened? My fault. Sometimes when I daydream, I bring others along for the ride. It was unintentional, yes, but there was no harm done, correct? You'll be fine. <laughs> so, I could either be really prudish about it, or I could be like, okay, whatever. So, I'm going to go with the whatever response. So, who are you, Mr. Algernon? Greetings, young human. Yeah, so he doesn't recognize me at all. The elf's voice is smooth as silk and rich as clotted cream. Something about him instantly puts you at ease. I am Algernon Halfdream, the owner of this establishment. In my shop, you will only find the finest in magical paraphernalia. Now, tell me, how may I serve you? Well, let me see your inventory. So there, if I want to get the next... uh. If I wanted to get a mage outfit, I can get it from him, but this is a pretty decent amount of spells this early on, so that's good. Now, can I ask him any questions? Okay. Da -da -da -da. Okay. Nothing really there. All right. All right. So, not gonna talk to her for a while. I think I, I angered her or whatever. But whatever, or more, more so, I probably embarrassed her. Okay. So what do we got over here? Dancer's bag. Oh. Okay.
So I think that is where I go for uh, going off to runs. And you notice I'm being a lot more, uh, let's see, what's the word? Carefree with my funds. And that's kind of a thing that we'll see later on as we continue playing. The Romanchi Patriarch is an impressive figure, an enormous man in his late 60s, burly and broad-chested despite his age. His voice is deep and resonant, and his breath is heavy with the stench of t pipe tobacco. Tavan Bakstev, you're here to conduct some business, no? If so, I welcome you to Matricovus Arms and Ammunition. If not, keep on walking. Well, you're in good luck. I have cash and I am in need of weapons. Show me what you got. So, right now my things are pretty bad. <laughs> and I think in comparison to the first game, they do add a lot more kind of unique weapons early on. Like right now, I have the option between the basic SMG and one that has a smart leak on it. Whatever that does, I don't know, but it sounds cool. <laughs> um, I mean, hell, I can get sniper rifles at this at this stage of the game. I could actually get, actually get more uh, armor-focused stuff if I wanted to. So, definitely a lot more flexibility here than before. Okay. Let's talk to F Mr. Flash over here. The elf has clearly seen better days. His skin is weathered and emaciated, as though it has been stretched too thinly over his frame. Track marks line the crookeds of his arm, and dirty bandages wrap his knuckles. Despite all of this, he seems cheerful enough. The elf fixes his twinkling, bugged-out eyes on yours, and offers you a broad smile, displaying an impossibly white set of teeth. When he speaks to you, his voice is surprisingly deep. Guten Tag, my friend. You here for some magic? Because Zack Flash is your magic man. <laughs> oh boy, I might be interested. Well then, I'll be able to help you. He begins to twist a strand of long, strangling hair around one of his spidery fingers. His smile remains fixed, a purely crescent set into the face caked with grime. Well, don't leave me in suspense. What do you have? Oh, a little bit of everything. I've got your Zen and your Hyper, your Nitro and your Nova Coke. If you want it, I've got it. He leans towards you and lowers his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. I've even got a special concoction of my own design. But I re wouldn't recommend it unless you're serious about getting high. So, you want to conduct a little business? Hmm, you said you need magic. Are you a street mage? Street mage? Me? Do I look like one to you? He shakes his head, but his smile doesn't waver. He flashes a small bag of pills out of his back pocket and dangles it before your eyes. No, Chummer, I'm not a street mage. I've got a magic in my blood, but the magic in these bags, but you won't catch old Zack studying any spell books. Well, let me see what you got. Da -da -da. Okay, so could use these maybe, but not right now. So here, if I want to get some new cyber pieces, I would go here. So here, I can listen in on this conversation. Da -da -da -da. He presses a button on his comm link and looks up at you, a million dollar smile on his face. Sorry about that, my friend. Welcome to the Triage Cyber Clinic. I am Dr. Xavier Esquibil, and your name is... Smaltzy. Pleasure. Pleased to meet you. What can I do for you today? I need some cyberware. So here, I can already go and get some cyber stuff, and there's com actually some useful stuff here. So like, uh... Interesting that I can actually get a different type of data, ja data jack, with a little bit less essence cost, but I don't think I can remove it. At least what I have so far. Hmm. Oh, I get it. So I can replace that for the head. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. I think there's only a couple more places to visit, and then we go to the actual main story stuff. Okay. Simi, what do you got? 
Warming herself in the dim light of the dying street lamp is a waif of a girl who looks too worn for her years. The Mother Superior. She says there will be seven for me to care for. I need to see them. Seven what? What do you have to care for? The Captain's children. The Mother Superior says there are seven. She says I am to be the governess to the children. You notice a chipjack poking out beneath the young woman's unruly hair. The vacant look in her eyes marks her as a BTL junkie, lost between reality and any number of better-than-life virtual constructs. I need money to get back to them. This sounds familiar. Captain Von Trapp is very well known and respected. The poor dear lost his wife and the children their mother. A child should not be without their mother, and a mother should not be without a child. Have you seen the captain? Look, do you know Monica or no? Monica? Is she one of the sisters at the Abbey? No, wait. A flicker of recognition fights through the haze in the young woman's eyes. Yes, Monica. She's good to me. Bring me food to eat and tea to drink. I'm afraid I have some bad news about her. Despite the woman's persistent delirium, she seems to glean meaning from your tone. She died. Well, yeah, I'm sorry she did. The girl grips her head with claw-like hands, tugging at her hair as if she might pull her brain out through her skull. I do not like this, but I can't switch it off. The girl's frail body shudders and her eyes grow large, but she does not sob. Instead, she smiles a sad smile, which looks like to be worn out all too often. She will go to heaven, she told me. It is a place for good people, stillborn babies, and childhood pets. And she was a very good person. The girl begins to mumble to herself, while fingering the hair that covers the jack in her head. Okay. Well, that's sad. Oh, what's this? Bizarre monument towers up before you. At the top, the form of an angel stands, its outstretched wings looming over the small park. But the material is strange and uneven giving the statue a cold Frankenstein-esque experience. It appears to be that the artist welded this monument together from various metal scraps and pieces of junk. As you approach, a small grimy monitor at the base flickers dimly to light. The grainy face of a smug young orc appears on screen. Hello there, I am Herdbit's Kunzel, the creator of this monument. What would you like to know? Okay. Tribute to victory, victory of the anarchy, da 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 da. Yeah. We'd be here all day if I read every single little thing, but it seems to be a phone ringing. Let's check it out. It's an old obsolete phone booth. It's ringing. A monotone, pitch-adjusted voice begins speaking almost immediately. The Sch Schockwine writer's contract for this case is no more, small z, is listed as a follow-up contact. This is our secure line to this case. Please listen to the following instructions carefully if you are a supporter of our cause. Hmm, okay. We have phone booths in strategic locations throughout the city. Within each one, you may find a request posted for specific information. If you can't obtain a copy of this information, return here and submit it via the port below via the, the receiver. We will verify the authenticity of the information remotely, and post an undocked copy it, of it onto the matrix ourselves. It is our stated goal for this information to remain free to all. However, you will be compensated for this sought-after information returned to this location. Okay, I'll keep an eye out. So that was ominous. Maybe we can do something later for it. Or maybe that's kind of like our fixer. Could be. So we need to go down there eventually, but I think we got a couple more contacts to meet. Lane, there he is. Uh, there he goes. Before you stands a troll, though it is a stretch to say he is standing at all. His great mass is barely held upright by two vintage prosthetic legs, along with a crutch under one arm. His body clicks and hums with every shift of his weight. Despite these disabilities, his eyes are sharp and calculating. Do I know you? 
I haven't really been here long. New to the cruiser bar, then. Heard Monica had some fresh meat in her stable. I'm Smaltzy, by the way. Good to meet you. Name's Aleski Lane. What's your place here? No place, really. Just an old relic rusting away. Look, I hate to be the bit bearer of bad news, but there's something you should know about Monica. Something happened to her on the run. I'm afraid so. There have already been whispers. I had a feeling, besides. Monica always comes around after a run to check on everybody. She's long overdue, and now here you are in her place. So she's either severely wounded or outright dead. Which is it? I'm afraid she's gone. The grizzled troll nods grimly. The servos in his prosthetics complain as he lo lo lets loose a heavy sigh. Now that's a shame. She was a hell of a runner, that one. And a good friend. Well, I'll live you to mourn in peace. At the sound of your approach, the orc turns to face you. He wears a severe expression, but there is kindness in his eye. Ah, hello, human. As you can see, I'm in the middle of a conversation with my assistant. The volunteer worker holds her silence, but her expression is full of naked hostility. Samuel gives her a sidelong glance, and she seems to get the message. The fire in her eyes dies down to a low simmer. But we do not want to be impolite. Is there something I can do for you? I couldn't hear, help but hear, overhear your... Uh. I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. Do you run some sort of charity? Yes, it isn't much, but we can, but we do what we can. Such as? In the past years, I have established a shelter where the dispos dispossessed can sleep, a soup kitchen to feed the hungry, and a library for people of the Crucibar to better themselves. It isn't much, I admit, but it's a start. A good start, Samuel. You mustn't be so hard on yourself. There are limits to what one man, even a determined man, can accomplish. This is true. He nods to the orc on his side. Thankfully, some of the residents that I've helped over the years have come around back to help me. I've got 15 assorted orcs and trolls from all around the Crucibar working for with me now. They help me man the soup line, stock the library shelves, and to do all the hundreds of other little things that a community organization needs to get done every day. These extraordinary individuals are the living proof that what we do here has value. They are ins my inspiration to continue forward. She beams at the compliment. From her body language, it's clear that she idolizes Beckenbauer. Now, do you have any more questions? If not, I will bid you good day. I don't want to sound self-important or rude, but there are many pressing matters that demand my time. Hmm. Say, so, I don't want to be too discriminatory, but does that mean other races aren't welcome within your organization? That's taking a rather narrow view of what we do. Yes, it is true that my assistants are all members of the goblinoid races. It's also true that before they were accepted, they were thieves, gangers, and deadbeats. This is not because they were bad people. This is because those of us with goblinoid traits are feared, mistreated, and denied gainful employment by a society that hate us. I hire only them because mainstream human society has created a need for me to hire only goblinoids. The orcs and trolls deserve a workplace where they will be treated with dignity and respect. All that being said, our services are available to all. We wouldn't turn a desperate person away, regardless of that person's metatype. Even humans, the most privileged of all races, are welcome at our door. Isn't that what's most important? Hmm. Let me think on this. On the one hand, I do not like hypocrisy. But this is a different kind of world, and yeah, I can kind of understand where he's coming from. So, I'm going to go for the uh, neutral option. I'll reserve my judgment. You're helping people, and that's what's important. Good of you to understand. Now, is there something else you would like to talk about? Are you accepting donations? Yes, of course. We're actually desperate for them, truth be told. People seem more intent on taking care of themselves than they are providing for the less fortunate. Of course, these concepts are not unrelated. As poverty rates increase, so does the crime. Assisting the needy increases the quality of life for all. In any event, our shelter has some basic needs that desperately need to be filled. 
The walls of the shelter are not insulated, and new blankets would go a long way towards keeping our guests healthy and comfortable, really. Ideally, we'd like to purchase some space heaters as well. With 250 new yen, we would make the purchase whatever you could spare would be most appreciated. Well, you know what? Here you go. This is incredibly generous. Thank you, my friend. Not a big deal, Sam. Do good with it. Wait, I just realized. His name is Sam. <laughs> the last time we had someone named Sam, it did not end well. Anyway, with this donation, we have reached our first goal. Thank you so much for your assistance. I will put your contribution to work stocking the shelf with blankets and heaters. Please, do not over d downplay your contribution. You have shown kindness at a time that few others will. This means something. It means a great deal. So, uh, this is kind of your, uh, big money pit for the entire game. Now, what it does, I'm not, I don't remember exactly, but, uh, I'm going to kind of go with it for right now. Yeah, we need to get our, uh, what do you call it? Chances up, because we are really bad at this. <laughs> We're good for decking for a while, so let's just focus on combat right now. All right, no more uh, screwing around. Let's actually go into the actual main story stuff. So now we're in Cafe Chavez. I don't know how you say that. I doubt I'll have any German viewers tell me how to pronounce things, but uh, go ahead and keep, keep a list because boy, I'm probably gonna but butcher the entire language. <laughs> oh, I'm doing such a disservice to Nietzsche. I hope he can forgive me. Oh, um, look at this. Who's this guy? Jan Goldensmitch. Hello, friend. The voice that comes from the man in the chair is as enormous as its owner, a deep, booming roar dripping with unrestrained mirth. A fine day for So Cafe, yes? Yes, it is a certainly beautiful. From the back of the d store, the voice of the shopkeep cuts you off. Don't mind the fool in the chair. He roars like a traumatized walrus, stewing all day on his own sweat. The man behind the bar glances at Golden Smith, his upper lip curled in disgust. I tolerate him only because he takes his soy cafe by the bucket. Golden Smith responds with a raucous belly laugh. Apparently he finds the shopkeeper's insults to be hilarious. Ah, Otled, mine friend, you are as quick-witted as sharp-tongued as ever. I bow to you. Are you going to put... Once again, the shopkeeper cuts in. To bow to me, you would have to first vacate your chair. The shopkeeper claps his hands together, clasping them in front of his chest. I shall summon a team of determined young men and an ox to assist you with the task. With luck, you'll be on your feet by nightfall. Golden Smith smiles up to you, his small eyes glittering. Enough of this senseless bickering. You have approached me for a reason, yes? Tell me, what can Jan Golden Smith do for you? Look, I don't want to be a dick, but if something bad is going to happen if he doesn't stop interrupting me. Oh, don't mind our dear Atlug. He's a peevish man, but his ire is not directed at you. I have the distinction of being the sole target of his rage and derision. It is a badge that I delight in wearing. You know, I know a good banter and all, but don't you have any pride for yourself? I put up with them because they amuse me. The fact that they amuse me infuriates my dear Atlug, who in turn hurls more insult. He raises his soy cafe in salute. And thus the cycle continues. It is two years now that I've been your customer, yes? Two years of soy cafe and strained patience, yes. And I remain happy, and Atlug makes money. An ideal business relationship. Well, I guess that all sounds pretty her perfectly healthy. Take care. Until next time, my friend. Well, that was a complete waste of time. <laughs> Alright, let's talk to Atlug here. The man behind the counter looks past you and at the dog following close behind. Dante. I will fetch his water dish, and perhaps a coffee for our friend here. Soy cafe, black. The Turk looks disgusted. Very well, a soy cafe. He tisks to himself. Oh. I guess I did something wrong. The demeanor behind the counter has a broad smile, and an open demeanor of a classic Tur Turkish street vendor. Welcome, Otter... It find him. Welcome. And how can 
Bur oh god. Barak Aziz serve you today. Would you like a cup of coffee, perhaps? Wait, you mean real coffee? Yes, for individuals of refined taste, I offer genuine bean coffee from my native Turkey. Native Turkey. The cafe owner looks over you in serious. In the cafe owner looks at you, see it in the eye. The tone of his voice grows low and serious. This is a top shelf item, my friend, and not for general public. Only those few discerning connoisseurs can properly appreciate it. Well, you have my interest. Tell me more. It is handpicked by my family in Turkey, a true delicacy of the sixth world. This was considered a luxury even before the awakening, when the bean coffee was everywhere. Every street corner, they say. He leans in closer, lowering his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Long hours in the shop have perfumed, perfumed his body with the commingled scents of coffee, incense, and applewood tobacco. Trust me, if your coffee experience has been limited to soy cafe, you must not deny yourself this opportunity. You will see God. <laughs> okay, a little too much, don't you think? Alright, you sold me how much? This is a specialty item. Delivered at some cost. I cannot part with it for less than 50 new yen a cup. Maybe another time. As I said, these items are not for everybody. Was there something else? First, Paul Amzil sends his regards. When he hears his name, the Turkish voice lowers and his accent becomes less exaggerated. His eyes take on a knowing look. Ah, very good. Please express to Herr Amzil my appreciation of his patronage. If he needs any more catering jobs seen to in the future, I am always happy to provide. Well, Paul's always pleased to send business your way, but uh, he was hoping you could discuss some details of this Green Winter's order with me. His, the, offer, the owner offers you a smile. Of course, of course, Herr Amsel is only too kind. Borowski turns his head and calls into the back room. Kami, come. A young woman bustles in from the back room. Her gum chewing is loud enough to hear over the noise of the coffee grinders. Baraski spits something out of the rapid fire Turkish. Baraskazi spits something out in rapid fire Turkish. As you wish, Uncle, I will see to it right away. Kami offers you a shy grin, snaps her gum, and hurries back into the room that she came from. My girl is arranging to make contact with this chef as we speak. This will likely take some time, my chef. This will likely take some time. My chef is a busy man, you know. While we wait, I wonder if you would be so kind as to run a small errand for me. A trifle, really. I hate to trouble you. I'm even embarrassed to even ask. But it would be most helpful if you could. But I would be most appreciative of your help. Well, what is it? The errand is simple, hardly worthy of you. I have installed a number of data trap taps to Berlin's fiber optic network. As part of civic duty, you understand. These taps provide free matrix access to all who live in the Kuzabar. Cruise Bazaar. In order to maintain their, how do I say it, anonymity, each TAPS protocol buffer must be reset every few days. I simply wish for you to visit each data TAP and reset it. Simple enough? Yes, it is a simple job. Time consuming and a bit tedious, perhaps, but simple. Just reset the TAPS and come back when you are finished. There should be three scattered around this neighborhood. The first one is just outside. Look for a metal box with yellow arrows painted on top. By the time you return, I should have the information Herr Amsel requested. Well, this doesn't seem sketchy whatsoever. Now, the real purpose is to actually get you to explore the town and visit all the people, but uh, I kind of did that all already, so that's why I'm kind of furthering it along at my own pace. Oh, there it is. Okay, need to find two more. Probably in each corner of the map, if I'm correct. There's number two. And the third one's probably by that payphone over there. Yep.
As you're resetting the data tab, you notice that someone has duct taped a small homemade receiver to the system. An earbug, an earplug dangles from the receiver. The sounds of heavy machinery makes it difficult to hear the words that are being spoken. After a moment, you find that you can make out two distinct voices. A nasal woman who sounds like a heavy smoker, and a man who speaks in a high-pitched, red, breathy tone. Just heard, Monica. Need to verify. Good for us. A sound of like a conveyor belt starts adding to the noise of machinery. You can make you can't make out anything else until it comes to a stop a minute later. Think of our next step. Wait, isn't ready to make a move yet. To be patient. See who steps up. Could be someone more. More conveyor belts start up. All you can hear is the sound of machinery. Some sort of motorized, ve motorized vehicle starts up, drowning out everything else. A bell rings loudly and again, it sounds like a telephone. You hear the sound of a door slamming shut, and the noise of machinery is suddenly muffled. There's a rattle of plastic and the ringing stops. The nasal woman's voice can be heard again in a sing-song tone. Guten Tag, how may I help you? And then silence. Her tone changes and becomes more businesslike. I heard. Yes, he knows. I told him it wasn't time to make a move yet. What do you think I am, an idiot? The council needs to meet again. I know, getting everyone in the same route is challenging. Getting them to agree to on a course of action is going to be even more challenging. From my perspective, the cruise bazaar was only stable because of her. If she really is out of the way, well, we'll see, won't we? Ja, I know, I know. What can I say? Things go slow and in the flux sometimes. You hear the sound of a door opening again, and the cacophony of machinery fills the line. You can't make out anything more. Hmm. Well, if this is a sequel, we did have one council meeting, and that was for the inse insects that we fought of at the very end. So, uh, maybe it's the same council? Maybe it's a different council? Who knows? To be honest, I've actually only played this once, so I'm not really familiar with the main story as much as I, as you may think. But anyways, we got the data jacks done, now we can talk to Atlug again. Welcome back, honored f and M. How may I serve you? Well, your errand is little is done. Well, your errand is finished, Herr Baraske. Oh man, these names. Well, I finished your little trifle, Herr Baraskazi. Ah, very good. I assume you had no difficulties. Hmm. Difficulties, no. One of the traps had been modified a bit, though. Someone was using it as a surveillance device. Of course they were. I would be surprised if they weren't. This is Berlin, after all. In the flux, everyone spies. If you do not, how will you know who is in power and who will be in power next? If you are to stay here, Ephidim, you must get used to it. Who enters the Turkish bath will sweat, as my uncle always says. Nevertheless, I shall have one of my people look into it. Well, I listened on the tap and I heard something. It may be important. Oh ho, tell me, listener of keyholes. What did you hear at the surveillance tap you found? Well, I couldn't make out much. There was a nasal woman and a high-pitched man. They seemed pleased Monica was out of the picture. News travels fast in Berlin. These two are known to me. Is there more? The woman's got a call. She's talked about a council meeting tonight and to decide what should be make a move. And should decide if they should make a move. Then she was drowned out by heavy machinery. Most excellent. It is indeed fortuitous that you discovered this information. That it was not unexpected. I will have one of my people attend this council and report back. Well... I'm interested at least, so let me know what happens. With that out of the way, let's return to our pressing business. He barks a stream of rapid fire Turkish and the gum chewer And the woman comes out again. <laughs> I'm not gonna read the entire thing. The menu for Herr Amsel, Uncle. Kam Kami holds you a folded piece of paper, and inside is a memory stick. Please extend my consolations to him. The death of Fraulein Schaefer must have hit him hard. Baraskazi gives Kami a small nod and she hurries out of the room. When, she, when gone, he returns his attention back to you. Please express my condolences as well. I only just heard the news. Monica was an important part of this community. Few know how important. 
The memory stick just handed to you should contain all the information Herr Amsa requires from our chief in the field. Should you require my services in the future, you know where to find me. Until then, have a good day. Oh, man. <laughs> Even though we had a bit of a longer combat sequence, boy, is this really tech-heavy at the beginning. But uh, we're nearly there, so we'll head back to the hideout now. Amsel peers at you apprehensively. His eyes are bloodshot, his expression grim. Did you get information about Green Winters? Yes. I spoke to Atleg. He gave me this memory stick. Well, let's see what his agent has to say. Amsel snatches the memory stick from your hand and slots it into the computer terminal. He navigates a series of command menus, and a wall of amber text floods the screen. He scans it, mouthing the words as his eyes flit back and forth. Baraska's eyes agent tailed Green Winters to a hotel in a cesspool of a kais called Drogenkipi. The hotel is called Das Kesselhaus, and is a renovated factory nestled deep into the heart of Drogenkipi. It appears that Winters is holed there. Recently there was some contention between two gangs over the control of this neighborhood. Due to the violence, the agent refused to follow Winters inside the hotel, but he confirms that he is still inside. Well, what are we waiting for? Iger slings her rifle over her shoulder with a single motion, spare motion. Gear up, people. We have a hotel to raid. Glory and Dietrich pause. Exchange looks with Paul. Just a moment, Iger. Amsel rises from his chair, drawing himself to full height. Even so, he has to crane his neck to look her in the eye. You are an excellent soldier, and nobody questions your competence in the field. Your loyalty to this team is equally commendable. That said, we believe Smaltzy is the right choice to lead this team. There's a long pause before Iger speaks. When she does, her voice comes out dull and flat. What? Don't mistake this decision for a reprimand. Monica consider your contributions to the team to be invaluable. But we all know she isn't comfortable putting a soldier in charge. Iger speaks through clenched teeth. Her words are measured, but her expression is livid. This is unbelievable. You want to put the rookie in charge. Again. She shakes her head. Don't you people learn from your mistakes? Smaltzy is the reason we're still alive, Iger. He kept us together. He led us out of there in one piece. Making him your golden boy. She sounds tired, resigned, but above all, disappointed. This is more your flux state idiocy at work, isn't it? Dietrich reaches out and puts a hand on her shoulder. It's what Monica believed in. Iger's voice tightens, and for a moment her control slips and her face contorts in grief. Yeah, and look at where that got her. She straightens to her full height. Let me give you a piece of advice. In the field, only two things matter, the mission and survival. Everything else is a distraction. Your ridiculous politics have no place on a shadow run. Dietrich manages a smile. What can I say? We're German. We have a history of strong political views. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that is the biggest uh, understatement of the year. <laughs> no, of the century. <laughs> oh man, that line. Oh, I love it. Iger sighs and the tone of resignation returns to her voice. Screw it, let's just put an end to this. I've got skill and experience to lead this team. Smaltzy, on the other hand, was appointed by Monica as a joke. If you rather take, if you would rather he take the lead, I'll abide by that. But I want to hear each of you say it. Well, I'll have no quarrel with you, Iger. I'll do as the group wishes. You stay out of this. She stabs an armor finger into your chest, hard. The moment she raises her hand to you, Dante's ears lays back and he lets out a low growl. Reflexively, she takes a half step back. I think we've heard what Dante has to say. For my part, Smaltzy saved our hides back there. You may not believe it, but he did. The way I see it, that means I follow his lead a while longer. I trust in Monica's judgment, therefore I trust in Smaltzy's judgment. The discussion is finished, Iger. Amsel speaks softly, but his tone is firm. Smaltzy will take Monica's place as the leader of this team. Look, I'll do whatever it takes to keep this team and Monica's legacy alive. That includes taking your advice, Iger. 
Iger gives you a small nod. That's big of you. She looks from Dietrich to Glory to Amsel, finally down at Dante. Then she sighs. I don't agree with this decision, but I will respect it. She nods again, more decisively this time. Smalty takes the lead then. Conversation closed. Good. It's time to move on, and we need to focus on chasing down Green Hit Winters. Indeed. I have transferred the information that we received from Atlug to the computer terminal in the next room. It was used to be Monica's personal workstation. Smaltzy, now it's yours. Monica kept a variety of notes and dossiers on that machine. I would suggest reviewing her notes when you have the time. Amsel turns his attention away from you and back to his computer screen. Good hunting. I will eagerly await your return. I wouldn't suggest driving to Drogenkapi. The roads aren't safe. Taking the U-Ball would be faster anyway. Well, thanks for the tip. Then we'll take the u bahn as it is. Iger nods, then turns to her checker equipment. The rest of the group... Oh man, this is reading. <laughs> Iger nods, then turns to check her equipment. The rest of the group disperses in turn. Alright, so now we have a team of Shadowrunners. And... Uh, what happens basically is if they get knocked out, you lose a member for a while and you need to use the Shadowrunners in the other Shadowrunners that you can hire in return. So, uh, yeah, if you use Trauma Kits, you basically avoid this problem. And you want that because I think these runners are free, so even more of an incentive to keep them alive. But, uh, we'll do that next time. Oh, hold on. Yeah, so this is a good place, if any, to stop. So, thanks for watching. Tune in next time where we actually go on as a team and uh, get some payback. But until then, catch you later.